I V M. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IVM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IVM swag. So do fill out those surveys. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Sakshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. A few of us, especially the historically inclined, might remember that there was a big hangama about this very interesting site called Sanoli in northwest India. Um, and there was a lot of discussion a few months ago, including a discovery documentary and so on, um, about where it fit into the picture that we generally have of early India and the peoples who were moving into the subcontinent, really making um, what we think of as the seeds, really, of Indian society at that time. Um, so I have with me today my friend Disha Eluwalia. Um, hi, Disha. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, for those who have been listening to All Things Policy on Friday, um, you'll know that Disha is an archaeologist. Um, and she's actually joining us today from the offices of the Archaeological Survey of India itself. Um, so I, I feel really quite special. Um, so Disha, you've been, you actually worked on the excavations at Sanali itself and you're um, broadly familiar with a lot of the discoveries that have been made there. So we have a whole bunch of questions for you today in terms of um, just understanding what the site is um, and what the hard archaeological facts on the ground are. Uh, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the interpretations and what it might mean for our understanding of early India. But um, before we continue, let me just remind our listeners that the Takshila Institution offers a whole bunch of really interesting courses, everything from defense and foreign affairs to public policy to uh, technology policy and healthcare policy. So if you're interested in any of these, you should really consider applying. Um, head over to takshashila.org.in slash courses. Um, the deadline is the 28th of August. So go and check it out. So without any further ado, let's begin. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the site of Sonali itself? What really went down at Sonali? So Sonali is a very interesting site. And uh, it was accidentally discovered back in 2005. So what happened was a farmer was plowing the field. And in his field, he found, he found few copper objects, some bones. And uh, the villagers gathered around and they thought that perhaps they have, you know, struck gold and there is some treasure there. And they started digging. But there were a few people or rather there was one person who was familiar with ancient pottery and, you know, ancient copper objects and etc. So he went ahead and he uh, discussed this matter with the authorities and they in turn informed Archaeological Survey of India who then uh, took over um, the site and they excavated the site for 13 months in 2005 and 6. Uh, during that excavation, about 116 burials were uncovered and uh, it, it, was a, it has remained one of those uh, very important archaeological sites of the subcontinent, uh, be it in school books or be it in college books. Sonali has always, uh, you know, reserved that highest position next to, I guess, to Harappa and Mohenjo-daro because of its sheer size and the antiquities that we have got. Uh, back then, they named it or titled it as the biggest necropolis of uh, ancient India in the subcontinent or, uh, you know, of uh, second millennium BCE. Hmm. Uh, but uh, when we were excavating, uh, you know, this time, Sonali again grabbed headlines. And as usual, you know, I've told you Sonali is one site which is always in the limelight. And when we excavated in 2018 and 19, two consecutive years, it again grabbed headlines. Hmm. So Sonali is one of those interesting sites. 116 burials is a lot of burials. Like I, I think that it, it easily ranks on par with 
uh, the number of burials to be found in major Indus cities as well. And these are cities that were occupied for like many, many centuries, right? Um, do you know anything about like how long Sonali was occupied for? You mentioned that it's a site that dates from the second millennium BCE. Do you know anything about like um, how long it was occupied? Um, any And what really does the archaeology tell us about um, the people who lived there? What did you guys actually discover uh, in your dig? And, and if you don't mind me asking... What was it like to like actually be digging through this necropolis and how did you feel as you were handling and discovering these objects? Well, um, to answer your first question, um, the density or, or the number of burials, of course, is, is unique at Sonali and there is no other site where we have found such large number of burials, even in Harappan context. And uh, Sonali's date, well, back when it was first excavated in 2005 and six, the excavator suggested that actually Sonali is dated to the last phase of 39 BC, that is 2000 or 2100, and goes all the way till 1800 BC. So Sonali, uh, the whole, the time frame was about three four hundred years that that they calculated. In our excavation, also uh, the dates that we have got, the scientific dates, all sort of resonates their uh, uh, relative date and you know to be able to excavate there um, interestingly I was not there during the first season that is 2018's excavation I was excavating another site which was part of the excavation camp I was excavating Barnava Hmm. which is about 22 kilometers east of Sonali. And uh, so that was actually the major site that we were excavating. Sonali was supposed to be just uh, one trial dig. Uh, you know, we were supposed to take just one trench and perhaps collect samples for dating and collect, you know, uh, samples for DNA analysis or something like that. But we really didn't realize or rather I'm talking about collectively when I say we, you know, I mean the entire team, we never realized that uh, we actually surprised us that we were going to end up finding such antiquity, such remains at Sonali. And, and that will sort of, you know, bring the name Sonali again to the, to the front page. We had no idea. Hmm. So in, during the first season, I was at Barnava excavating a site, which is more uh, from PGW all the way to Sultanate period. But in the second dig, of course, by then I was already involved with Sonali's post-excavation processing and I was aware of its antiquity. It was amazing to be able to be at a site which, which is so important, you know, which has literally changed uh, the way we look at history and is capable enough to uh, change a lot of preconceived notions that we have had about, you know, proto and prehistoric India. Um, it's it's one of those sites, really. That's, that's That sounds really exciting. And we'll come to that in like a couple of minutes. But I'm actually quite curious about um, Barnawa as well, uh, which, which you mentioned you were excavating in 2018. You said that um, it has continuous occupation from the painted greyware period to the Sultanate period, which 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 is what um, over three almost three thousand years, if not more than that. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> so most of the sites that you find in this area, you know, from Ganga Emra Dwap or Western Uttar Pradesh, hmm. the sites, even including Hastinapur, you know, sites like these, they are they have continuous history. They have huge, you know, uh, continuous chronology and the mounds are really high, like about 15, 18 meters high. And Barnava also is one of those sites. Uh, so from right from p- painted greyware, uh, you know, all the way to Satna period, we have continuous uh, occupation of the site. And even today, the site is occupied. So it's still in continuous, you know, uh, you know in, uh, under occupation. So I think that's really interesting to see that how a particular spot undergoes um, changes but continues to thrive as a uh, you know, spot for human uh, habitation. It's, it's interesting, actually. That's incredible. Um, so you mentioned a little earlier that there are these mounds in, in Barnawa, right? So that actually brings up like a, a few questions that I, I've generally had about archaeology. Um, how do these mounds form and um, generally what do you discover in these mounds how, how does the craft of an archaeologist actually work in terms of actually figuring out what kind of period uh, a particular bit of remains might come from um, and then kind of like classifying and analyzing that um, how, how does all that actually work so formation of mound or uh, as we usually refer to as site formation it 
basically depends on a lot of agencies and when i say agencies means air water uh, you know uh, and the general deterioration or aging of the site so what happens is that if a site is in continuous occupation it'll keep what what people do even today what we do is uh, we dig holes only for foundations today because we need to erect huge uh, you know big tower buildings but if yeah. we are just building you know one uh, you know few walls in our house we don't need to dig a deeper foundation so what happens is that for instance if a pgw occupants have occupied a particular area hmm. they have abandoned that area and that particular area is in no not in use so what people will do who are coming later on about you know 100 years or 50 years later hmm. they will try to accommodate that uh, you know unused or uh, you know uh, isolated area and they'll try to form another occupation around it and try to you know maybe utilize it for other reasons but as they'll put the cattle there or or they'll just flatten it destroy the site with fire there have been evidences where the earlier habitation be destroyed by fire and then another uh, uh, you know a habitation is erected so they will do that and, and not only the they it's not that other people are coming usually you know even let's just talk about the harappans you know or let's just talk about people from one cultural period they can also have multiple levels of occupation it's like you know I, my father constructed a house and i want to renovate it or i hmm. want to bring it down and build a new house so i'll do the same thing so remains of the older house will always be there in some way or the other so uh, as you go on you know over generations and generations the height of the mound will go on to increase and hmm. then you have if a site is for let's say abandoned for 200 years there will be other agents if it's closer to river the flood deposit will be there uh, the uh, airborne deposit will always be there so it's sort of uh, with the deterioration aging process and other agents and then human activities the mound will go on increasing and then when you have this whole system of creating forts you know in case of kushans hmm. they always look for spots which are little on a higher elevation also because of flood also people can also opt for higher elevated lands because of the flood so they will always choose lands which are higher elevated and then they will uh, occupy that area again and and it just goes on and on um it's very interesting that this phenomena is uh, is there even today all over the country uh, you know when we go on field surveys um it just amazes me to see that most of the sites either are in a uh, modern occupation or they are around a modern occupation let's say for instance rakhi gari the main uh, hmm. one of the mounds you know there are multiple mounds at rakhi gari uh, and one of the mounds have modern occupation but they people who are living on that one particular mound are also utilizing the other areas which constitute various of the mounds of the site of the hmm. ancient city of rakhi gari right so those areas are also used by um, modern habitants so a mound is in in uh, by definition is is an elevated land so, you know uh, so we uh, look for places where we find a little elevation uh, in the contour or we find any antiquity such as pottery pottery is everywhere right so uh, if they are creating a nala a drain they will be digging you know some sort of depression in the area and then the pottery will come out so eventually hmm. that pottery will be spread somewhere or the other and then of course the local knowledge uh, people are aware that they they you know some places if you go to villages and if you're surveying you try to communicate with people in their language and the villagers especially the older uh, generation they know where they you would find remains of an you know uh, earlier settlement so they usually pointed up, point uh, you know towards uh, that particular spot and and that's how we do it usually but with sonali it's interesting i'll come to sonali because sonali there was no mound there is no undulation it's flat hmm. it's flat because it's uh, basically it's an agriculture field where sugar uh, sugarcane is grown and there is no elevation at all 
so uh, whatever elevation w- would have been there uh, in the past was flattened to create uh, agriculture fields so that's the reason why sonali was accidentally discovered so if we miss out on certain sites they eventually come to light that's quite interesting and i do have a lot of follow up questions but um, before that let's just cut to a quick ad break are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service and are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money well your search ends here hi my name is anupam gupta and i am host of the paisa paisa podcast and i invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each monday on the ivm podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms see you folks okay yeah so this is absolutely incredible i think the the general impression that we very often have about archaeologists is that either you're like these indiana jones types who are like you know rushing into these uh, ancient temples or whatever and coming out to these priceless priceless relics or just spending a lot of time just like digging and mucking around and things but really i think w- what is really standing out to me from this is 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 that point you made about agencies you know the fact that um, all these layers are left behind by um water or by human factors or by wind over all these centuries and that somehow you actually have the tools to analyze and kind of piece together through all these little bits of information um this this story spanning thousands of years that, that's just so interesting to me so how does it actually happen like what does it actually involve how are you able to um figure out what has happened based on your digs um so um, of course it's not that easy uh, what we have to do is we have to really uh look at the site from the perspective you know it's it's geographical location first of all it's very important where it's located what's the landscape you know that like even if it's the present landscape and you know uh, we have largely uh, you know changed the landscape in many parts of the country but somewhere or the other uh, we can find or we can understand how the landscape would have been in the past so our first job is to understand where the site is located whether it's located on the banks of a river what's the nature of the river is it a shallow river or a deep river uh, you know how far is its flood plain uh if it's uh, you know for instance in rajasthan so uh, you know we we should know that there are agencies such as you know the sandstorms and eolian deposit that is the airborne deposit hmm. so that will affect a site so how it happens is that we uh, try to get information from the present society uh, present settlements in many parts of the country uh, we understand that a particular building material will undergo deterioration you know at such a rate and in, and will the end result will be this uh we understand now and we can very well differentiate between the airborne deposit and the uh, water bond deposit that is uh, basically it's it's sand silt and clay right or in eolian's case it's basically it's going to be more sand and silt hmm. uh Uh, but in the case of uh, water uh, air, uh, water deposit will be more clay sand and silt but we can understand on the basis of the context so context plays a very big role where in the trench where we finding what in what strata uh, so if we are excavating on the periphery of a site on the edge of a site very close to the river we sh- will get uh, some sort of flood deposit or some sort of water bond deposit okay hmm. uh, so we understand things from these perspectives we have to look at multiple things it's not just finding antiquities and recording it like people <laughs> would like to think but it's actually taking even the smallest of information and try to reconstruct the larger or a bigger picture about the past and it, and that's the reason why it requires a lot of people uh it's a multidisciplinary subject so it requires people from different walks of life to come together and piece the pieces you know uh, bring it bring it to life you know the whole story it's like a jigsaw puzzle we need to sort of fit things together and, and now everything is done scientifically so of course it's uh, we need scientific evidence to say a lot of things and so that's how it happens it's it's absolutely incredible like you guys are so much like detectives really like i don't know why there aren't like tv shows 
are just about like archaeologists like figuring things out and like piecing information <laughs> together like this like i was actually talking to um, mira ayer the convener of intact bangalore um, yeah. a few days ago um, and uh, about dhola vira and she she mentioned how um, electron microscopes are kind of being used now to analyze carnelian beads which have been discovered in mesopotamia um, to kind of figure out um, the kind of uh, boring drill that was used to create the beads um and that the electron microscope actually allows you to see such fine variations that you can track it down to like particular workshops or even to like particular hands or individuals it's incredible it's really incredible thing yeah, yeah that's really interesting because those beads for manufactured see they are um, a lot of agate reserves okay but you can find agate anywhere or, uh, but where the particular bead which the harappans the you know that's a marker of harappan culture that barrel shaped beads which is travel all the way to uh, not only mesopotamia very interestingly i was reading this book called river kings okay uh, oh yes yes about the vikings yes and and you know that same bead but uh, oh, thousands of years later on was found in a viking burial yeah yeah so that the whole craft is in continuation and of course there are many uh, uh, you know now means to understand even the smallest of things uh, but what is also important to uh, since you have mentioned about dhola veera uh, is that you know the early excavators who oh, they were so mindful of so many things before excavation like i remember when dr rs bish who excavated dola vera hmm. he spent an entire season only walking on the site hmm. because he wanted to understand the contour of the site and by understanding the contour he was able to understand uh, or rather visualize how the whole settlement would have been so these are these uh, you know small small things that we need to carry forward so uh, we have a lot of my you know a lot of things but what we need to understand is that um, human perception our our understanding of site formation and uh, other understanding is also very very important exactly and and the and it can always evolve right because as, as scientific tools get better as our understanding of these contexts get better then the the context in which we fit them the way that we interpret them exactly. is constantly evolving this actually brings me to like two very very brief tangents which we will not dwell on uh, promise um the first is like since you mentioned river kings desha the i i highly recommend to all of our listeners uh, to google this thing called the helgo buddha that's h e l g o um that's a 5th or 6th century bronze buddha made in kashmir uh, which was discovered in a lake near stockholm of all places <laughs> because that's how that's how that's how deep like eurasian trade was it's absolutely crazy yes. to think about um and the second thing is on on the question of dhola veera um hopefully we will do a podcast about that also at some point because it it's a totally incredible place and like if you get the time really look at the photos of the place because that you can you can literally quite literally imagine the lives of the harappan people who lived there um for over 1500 years and the kind of That's losses really and struggles um yeah it's it's an absolutely incredible place um so all right so so come back to sonali come back to sonali um the harappans are actually a very good kind of transition point to sonali because uh they very often like um this this is this is raging debate over whether sonali was a harappan site or not so what does the archaeology actually tell us disha what have you guys actually discovered there first of all i would like to mention that when it was um, excavated in 2005 and 6 and the excavators published a paper they uh, gave a relative dating and relative dating is a non scientific dating but dating based on artifacts and ceramics and other things so uh, we can now relatively date a lot of sites but of course we need absolute dating more scientific dating also hmm. so they dated the site uh, and they gave a broader chronology from 2100 bce all the way to 1800 bce and they the cultural affiliation of the site that you know they mentioned with this particular bracket was late harappan but with copper hoard elements now there are two cultural you know affiliations separate cultures hmm. not separate separate but cultures which uh, you know were uh, from they, they are neighbors but they had their own geographical boundaries hmm. it's like that. 
okay uh, so oh, copper hoard is affiliated with ocp or aqua color pottery hmm. which was christened at the site of hastinapur by professor bb lal and uh, this pottery is found at many sites from rajasthan the huge concentration is in ganga yamuna dwab and at the site of sai pai uh, this site was linked to the copper hoard so as the name suggests copper hoards they were always found in isolation and in hoards so copper objects found in large numbers in isolation and for a long period of time no one could understand where to put these this you know these hoards in a chronological context and it was the site of sai pai where an anthropomorph was found hmm. with the osni pottery in a stratigraphical context and it was clear later on that you know uh, that ocp and copper hoard uh, are same in other words ocp the hoard is nothing but the product of ocp users hmm. ocp using people now when i talk about ocp i need to mention its chronology its date uh, it's generally dated between 2600 bc and it goes on till 14 to 1200 bc so it is continuing parallel to the mature harappan phase fascinating okay? it's continuing to uh, along with mature harappan so when you have the mature harappan cities like bolavira rakhigadi kalibanga mojdaro harappa all of them flourishing we have on the other hand ocp sites also they were, they were flourishing and they were in contact or they were must be collaborating because they were you know You, there must be some sort of trade contact hmm. uh, because ocp is right at the center when linking with the eastern half of the country also and the late harappans uh, by definition uh, is the phase of harappa harappan civilization where de urbanization is taking place that is harappans are losing their urban character and they are more or less taking over their local characters and they are migrating to more suitable regions where they can sustain hmm. and uh, one of those area was the ganga yamuna dwab where sonali is located so when the early excavators termed it as a later up in site with copper hoard they sort of gave a very confusing or sort of gave a very um, uh, you know it sort of confuses us because 2100 bce is not late harappan hmm 2100 bce is very much the last phase of mature Mature, harappan yeah. because late harappan begins about 1900 bce hmm. so when they are saying is 2100 bce they are neither putting it in late harappan nor they are putting it in proper harappan and then you are linking it with ocp because all of the weaponry such as antenna swords copper objects they were non harappan in nature they were very much ocp copper hoard in nature hmm. so these were the questions that were in the minds of dr manjul when he decided to take a small trench along with barnawa and the idea was to take a sample at least to get the site dated absolute dating the site was very very much essential and uh, so you know we dated the site now and the site is dated to about 2000 2100 bc and it goes on till 1800 bc but our analysis and our understanding of the site in the light of the new discovery and in the light of new uh, you know evidences that we have unearthed suggests that the site is very much ocp oh fascinating yeah? but but we cannot create rigid boundaries between ancient cultures because a lot of it is in the intangible we can't hmm. see it correct we can only see the tangible so of course these people must be interacting with the harappans because they are taking some raw materials from them or they are trading with them it's very much evident you know that then stateite is used carnelian is used a lot of things but they're using the material but they're fashioning it as per their own likability hmm. so the fashion is different the material might be same so what we think and and also what my personal opinion of us and all is that we really need to now think in that light because the site is very much in the ocp epi you know that whole center of the ocp culture hmm. and we have so many weaponry so many copper objects now also on the coffins and chariots that we'll be of course talking about uh that it's just so difficult for us to ignore the fact that there is this overwhelming ocp copperhood aspect here 
you know hmm. it's overshadowing the earlier said harappan elements of course there must be some har there are some harappan elements we can't deny it you know humans never live in uh, such rigid boundaries unless and until you have uh, the the kingdoms and the dynasties set up but um, even then you, you, you very have, often have like very multi ethnic very often exactly even then trades are there no trade is happening uh, marital alliances are happening Hmm. uh and and you know there's so many things happening so but uh, the ratio of harappan to ocp if you look at that ocp uh the the percentage is more and of course the date is not late harappan 2100 bc is not late hmm. harappan so there's there's so many interesting questions here right so um if, if we can try to like get get like a fuzzy sense of what is happening perhaps through comparisons through other bronze age cultures we know that for example um the harappans were living as far away as mesopotamia we have examples of um records from the court of akkad for example which mentions uh, interpreters of the meluhan probably the harappan language um we know for example of merchants um whose bodies have been discovered in the levant uh, in israel if i'm not wrong um and Uh, an analysis of their teeth show that um these guys were actually eating bananas uh, which implies that they had actually visited and stayed in south asia at some point of time so you you clearly have and and when you say the mature harappan period right we're talking about um its most flourishing time really in terms of population this really is when um the harappan civilization has a population like in about like 4 million 4 4 or 5 million or so it it's got over a thousand sites that we know of so maybe even more in its heyday and it's equally on par or even like larger than uh, mesopotamia egypt and china perhaps even all of, them, all of them combined so it's it's a real kind of juggernaut of the bronze age world with like trade routes extending all the way into Ch- tajikistan and like all the way to the mediterranean and so on and like in 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 this mature period we also see this kind of extension this kind of integration happening right where um, patterns and city planning and standards it seemed that appear in harappa and mohenjodaro also appearing across this this vast expanse um and within this context it seems that you also have some kind of uh, urbanizing dynamic some kind of political hierarchy that's also emerging among the people of, of the ocp the people who are using this ochred color ochre colored pottery and creating these beautiful little uh, copper objects um and it it really brings up a lot of questions right because we know that other bronze age societies could be very multi ethnic very multilingual um so clearly there must have been ocp people living in harappan cities there must have been harappans living in ocp cities and, and one is really tempted to ask whether um we know that in, much later in the early historic period for example um when trade along the west coast of india and the southern part of india is kind of kicking off we start to see urbanization happening so one really wonders whether sonali's own urbanization the emergence of sonali as a major urban center is kind of tied to harappan history in this way and really what the harappans thought of these neighbors of theirs there's just so many interesting questions that come up from all of this see uh, what we need to understand is whether um, oh, what is the chronology when these two cultures are originating right now ocp is a chalcolithic culture whereas harappans were the bronze age civilization and here is the major difference between the two uh, we have a lot of regional chalcolithic cultures flourishing when harappans are you know uh, 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 creating big cities and they are trading with the western civilizations and they're spreading their wings hmm. we have a lot of chalcolithic settlements you know spread all across uh the subcontinent uh if we don't have chalcolithic we have neo chalcolithic or neolithics we have no in north also we have neolithic like burzum they were supporting or pro- providing lentils to the harappans and others also hmm. okay so in the pottery of burzum which is a, a neolithic site dated to about 2000 2100 bce uh the site there is there are certain potteries that we find where there are a lot of uh, you know bukrainian or those animal horned deity sort of motives and hmm. those are very really very much harappan and if yes. i had to narrow it down they are very much kot dijin they are from kot diji a side harappan side okay hmm. very much kot dijin which clearly shows that they the art also is traveling incredible okay? yeah you can't say that burzum people were harappans but you can we know that they were trading with harappans because the carnelian bead goes there the dal from burzum is going to harappans and vice versa there are other cities other settlements which are also doing the same things and we can find evidence of that 
there is nothing wrong in in doing that when you have ocp in ganga yamuna dwab and parts of you know rajasthan other places you have neo chalukyalitic also in in much eastern zone well, and and when i say neo uh, you know neolithic or uh, if i talk about take these prehistoric terms people usually go and straight away start imagining you know people who are uh, primitive yeah <laughs> but you need to understand that when you're talking about neolithic people they are already you know they are agrarian societies they might be ruler in nature they're not as urban as harappans but they have their own cultures their own uh, identities etc so you know around 2000 bc you do see other chalukyalitic cultures also existing not only just sanoli Uh, hmm. so we really need to broaden our horizon and understand when we talking about harappans and harappans evolution and then you know later on with late harappan its reurbanization hmm. we need to understand that harappans also evolved from an agrarian a largely agrarian based society uh, hmm. you know all the early harappan sites like i was just talking to a student re- uh, just an hour ago and we were talking about sites like nal You know, Nal is an early Harappan site, but look at the pottery of Nal. It's polychrome pottery. It's beautiful. That particular thing is missing in the Machar Harappan phase. Hmm. So it's it's Harappan, right? It's 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 you you we yeah, know that Harappans were dynamic. These aren't homogeneous entities. They're constantly evolving and like responding. Evolving. So why can't we have the same understanding for other cultures? Absolutely. and i also find it very interesting that um, you mentioned this point about this tendency to think of neolithic peoples as primitive um which which i find very strange right because neolithic peoples do not lack for their own like uh, culture and traditions they are, they they are they are also evolving they also respond okay. to historical forces um and they are also transmitting their traditions down centuries upon centuries and in many cases like up till um i know for example in in the malaprabha river valley which was the heart of the chalukya kingdom in the medieval period that you would have a situation where you have these uh, sanskrit speaking kings who are building these very elaborately carved temples in roughly the 7th 8th century ce and alongside that people are still going and you know burying their dead in dolmens or you know uh, worshiping menhirs and that kind of thing so it, these these are not primitive people at all these, these are people no, who are very not. well aware of like where they're coming exactly. from and who are capable of like i mean they they are as um capable of multiculturalism and like you know dealing with modernity as as we are we really need to understand that we humans are capable of doing that yes. we are not as rigid as we like to <laughs> believe we are we can do that and so you know what is very interesting here that we really need to look if we are giving harappans due credit if we giving harappans due credit of uh, you know for civilization actually if we giving harappan civilization due credit that it evolved Hmm. over a period of time it changed it's dynamic we hmm. really need to understand that the other cultures also are dynamic absolutely and and there are and that's what happens when sites like sanoli are uh, discovered it challenges the built narrative it I really agree. Ch- yeah so that i think that's what's happening uh, of course we need to excavate more and we need uh, more a micro study that is in a study of the excavated material uh, we can start with ceramics for instance because ceramics is the alphabet of archaeology it's hmm. a product which is found in large numbers it doesn't get corroded like metal um and you know it survives uh you know it 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 stays there and it never gets deteriorated it takes time for a ceramic or pottery to get deteriorated so i think pottery is a very important uh aspect or artifact that we need to study in the in the new in the light of the new discoveries hmm really the archaeologist's best friend as it were yeah, actually <laughs> some consider it as a black hole also hmm uh, something like resembling a nuclear waste i guess <laughs> Damn. some people really hate it <laughs> um this uh, actually before we move on to uh so i'm excited i just want to, i just have like one uh, final tangent beca- because i i know that our listeners are, I'm, i'm sure you all are like uh, very very excited to like learn about what's actually been discovered at sanoli but um one thing just occurred to me is that the the harappans are able to make bronze right and bronze requires both copper and tin um tin is not something that is very easy to find in the subcontinent so the harappans were generally importing it from afghanistan or like even further away and it it really like brings up the question like clearly all the other cultures or many other cultures at least in in the subcontinent at the time were aware of 
like copper smelting technology. Uh, but perhaps like they simply did not have the ability to trade for tin and therefore make bronze objects the way the Harappans did. Um, so it's... Sorry, uh, do, do you want to correct me there or something? Because in that case, I was... <laughs> no, no, I continue. Actually, I just wanted to say that, you know, smelting copper and making a copper object uh, without tin is much more difficult than creating a bronze object. So but, Yeah, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. So clearly, these people are don't lack for technological skill and sophistication. It's about resources and trade connections and, no, no, and yeah. creating the kind of like enormous surplus um, to, to, to accumulate resources from, from wildlife areas uh, which the Harappans were capable of doing due to the particular nature of their kind of culture um, but that does not necessarily make them any 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 greater or grander really than any mm-hmm. anybody else who was living in the subcontinent at the time so that brings us at last to the the question of Sanoli itself um, but um, before that let's just cut to a quick ad break hey it's been another great week on the IBM podcast network on the Edge of the Sledges Cricket Podcast, in the first half, Ashwin is joined by Varun to wrap India's ODI tour of Sri Lanka. In the second half, DJ joins the party to discuss the first T20 international between India and Sri Lanka. If you'd like to hear more about this match, former Indian cricketer Sabha Karim joins Rajiv Mishra and Khel Niti and they talk some more about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're really excited to announce a new show, a show about crypto with Rohan Joshi. He's going to dive deep and demystify all this crypto stuff that we've been hearing about. And let me tell you a little bit more about stuff that's going on on the network really quickly. Congratulations to Maru Kinayat, who celebrates 50 episodes of The Note with a discussion on health as a fundamental right. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam talks to Harsha Chetanwala of MyWealthGrow.com. Sarina Punawala is starting a new miniseries on emotional intelligence. Do check out the kickoff episode on the Empowering series and Simplified talks about semiconductors. Do follow us on social media where IBM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any other show for that matter, please do tell a friend. That's really helpful for us. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors on the network this week. They make this all possible. Thank you very much, Siet, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, Lenovo, and CoinSwitch Gobert. We really appreciate your support. Okay, so Sonali, Sonali, um, perhaps a great settlement of the uh, ochre colored pottery people who are living contemporaneously with um, the mighty Harappan civilization. Um, what does the archaeology actually tell us? What have you guys discovered um, at this extraordinary site, the Shah? So in uh, 2018, uh, Dr. Manjula, our director, he decided to take up a trench about 10 meters by 10 meters. And it was very close to the spot where 116 burials were found. And the idea was very simple, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and as you were excavated, uh, like as the team was excavating, we were, you know, initially excavating there, uh, we were quite, quite aware of the fact that we we're going to find some of some amazing artifacts. We were aware um, because we have seen the antiquities from the earlier excavation. And we know that Sonali has this, uh, you know, it can just surprise us at any point. So uh, the first thing that they found was, you know, one of the first thing that they found was the antenna sword. And this was no antenna sword, like, uh, you know, no ordinary antenna sword. It was a special antenna sword. And they have been... Uh, they are references to many antenna swords that were found with copper hoard. But this one was special because it has hilt. There was no antenna sword that was earlier excavated with hilt. And the reason hilt is important is that without hilt, the antenna swords were labeled earlier, were labeled as mere ritualistic objects. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay, because we archaeologists have a habit if we can't answer anything, we just play with the <laughs> Okay, hmm. so it was <laughs> because, of course, there is no hilt. So you can't use the sword because there, are, there is only antenna and then the blade starts. There's no place for you to hold. So if you're actually using it, uh, you know, you're, you're bound to um, cut your hand or something like that. So, of course, you needed a hilt. What is unique about this particular antenna sword is that the hilt was uh, covered with copper wire. Okay, so the wood decomposed, but the wire remained. Fascinating. Hmm. So because of that wire and the sediments inside, we were able to understand and we were able to piece, uh, you know, the evidence together and uh, really understand that the earlier antenna swords that were without hilt were actually hafted on a wooden hilt. 
so they were wooden hilt and because wood decompose and because our country is too hot and we can't find uh, much uh, you know wood remains or we can't identify wood that easily hmm. uh, they were not able to identify it but because of this copper wiring you know one small piece of evidence we were able to piece so many things together and this is the only evidence in the entire copper hood realm uh, you know the antenna sword with hilt and that sort of was very interesting it hmm. it cleared one of the research questions and now we knew that most of the weapons that were found in copper hood were not not ritualistic <laughs> they were actually used by people okay hmm. another as we were you know the team was excavating they started to find remains of a coffin like structure so first there was you know few anthropomorphs a few disfigured copper um, inlays and then you know slowly they were just mapping out how big the coffins were and then they were excavating and they started to find legs so another thing that came to light was that the dead was buried not on a in a box coffin hmm. but on a legged coffin so they, it is you know there are legs uh, and there is a small box with the lid and that's how they have buried the dead as they were excavating you know uh, they started to find you know copper pipes and copper pipes yeah the copper pipes uh, that was attached to the chariot ah. so when the those that copper pipe that were popping out of the uh, you know on the tr- in the trench they thought that must be you know uh, part of a throne or something and i remember dr manjul came back that one evening and he was discussing and he's like you know i think it's a throne or it's it's like a it's like a seat or something and this these copper pipes are used to hold the you know the umbrella or something like that or to for shade or something but i think there is something here and i we need to excavate you know in, in a particular manner and he was very excited hmm. and i was very excited to listen to him because i was excavating barnawa and then suddenly uh, in 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 a week's time you know these people come back and they are so happy in the evening and it must be around 8 o'clock in the evening and these people came back and they were smiling and and everybody was so happy and they were like you won't believe what happened and um because we don't get to communicate during the day because you know we all us we get so busy in our uh, you know work so we were sitting and he was like you know i think we have uncovered something amazing it's going to blow everyone's mind hmm. it's going to make uh, people go crazy and i was like what is it he said we got chariots Damn. and i for one thought that it's the small chariot it's like the dimabad chariot Hmm. you know the that sculptures that are housed in uh, national museum i really thought that you know there are those small <laughs> toys or uh, something the miniature chariots i know and i was like chariots and I, i like i want to see pictures so the camera was dead so they like they will show it to me but that never happened of course hmm. uh for a few more days and my my to my surprise when i reached the site you know when i finally wrapped up barnawa and i remember the date 26th of may i wrapped up barnawa and it was time for me to go to san ali now and i am i am so amazed and i knew there were chariots hmm. i knew there were multiple chariots wow. of course i knew about the coffins because i visited the sites when the coffins were excavated but i had no clue about the chariots and of this size and i remember i was just standing on the bock you know near, near the trench and uh, dr manjul he comes next he's standing next to me and he's like didn't i tell you that we have <laughs> discovered something amazing and, and the first thing i said that if i was excavating this site i don't think i would have ever excavated that Hmm. I don't think so because it is so difficult to excavate a sonali the sediment is so horrible it's your biggest <laughs> enemy because you know a it's an agriculture field hmm. so it's moist all the time hmm. b it, it's the 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 content of the soil the sediment there's more clay so clay is very hard when it's exposed you know and and it becomes hard as it it goes on um, you know as as time goes by and it's so difficult for us to excavate so difficult hmm. because our pickaxes don't work then hmm. and because of clay it becomes you know our scrapers don't work hmm. 
Hmm. So we had to get dental tools oh. and sculptures, oh. uh, sculptors' tools, and and all of that to be able to excavate Sonali. So that's why I said, you know, if I was there and excavating this site, I don't think I had, I, I wouldn't have visualized. Not and so. Dr. Manjul and his wife, they both were directors, co-directors of the excavation, hmm. and they both were excavating. And Dr. Manjul is an artist, actually, he's a painter. Hmm. I think his artistic sense really helped him to visualize because there was just one piece of copper triangle that came out accidentally and he realized that there is something on the vertical face so instead of going horizontal they have to now go vertical and bang on the the, the uh, wheels of chariots are exposed because of that very uh, you know uh, important decision that he took uh, otherwise, hmm. it's very easy for us to destroy wheel because we're excavating horizontally, right? And the wheels are standing vertical. Hmm. We, and they're not standing just vertical. They are at a particular place to so be able to identify the spot for the wheel and to be able to identify where the vertical phase of the wheel will be without hmm. damaging the wheel. It's very, very difficult or very difficult. So uh, kudos to him. And and his wife, you know, they were able to use their experience in the field and they were able to use their expertise and they were able to do this. It's such a learning experience, to be honest. Um, and I was numb. I think the whole entire day, I didn't speak to any, anyone. <laughs> wow. I, I remember I was, I, I was super tired that day, but I think after looking at the chariots, I was just, you know, numb. I, I couldn't do anything. Of course... Uh, Sonali is, is amazing in many aspects also. Uh, it's it's documentation. It's the lifting of the chariots were also very uh, important. But apart from chariots, uh, what was also very important at Sonali were the weaponry. Hmm. So uh, there were not only antenna swords, there were blade swords, daggers, shields, and, uh, you know, a, a smaller uh, swords as well. So hmm. there, there's this whole group of weaponry that we were able to find at Sonali, which really tells us a lot about the people who were buried there. Just, just incredible. Like this, this whole thing. Like I, I had a huge grin on my face for like most of it because, um, wow. I mean, it's a, it's just such a fascinating human story. Just, just learning about how these things were like rediscovered, and even one, one thing that that I'm really absolutely in awe of is, is the fact that. Uh, so I just kind of imagine what these buildings were actually like, you know, like the kind of people who actually made them. They're evidently um, a warlike people. That's why they're investing so much in creating um, all these implements of war. Um, they're evidently wealthy enough. They're evidently sophisticated enough to make some um, fairly extraordinary objects of craft craftsmanship, right? Like it, it, to build a chariot is a fairly remarkable engineering feat, just generally yeah. speaking. Um it, it's also interesting because it, it seems to suggest to me that um, they were at least generally aware, perhaps, of, of the broader uh, developments within Bronze Age warfare, which which are moving towards using chariots. Um, so this is also like the time where you you're seeing these um, massive wars between Egypt and uh, and the um, the Assyrian Empire, if I'm not wrong, uh, and they are also using chariots. So it's it is difficult to establish really exactly what they knew and so on, but it, it's still kind of interesting to think of them as part of this highly globalized world, right? And then they're burying their leaders in these elaborate mausoleums, uh, probably, you know, flickering with light and um, decorated with all these grave goods that they were able to produce. Uh, and then it, it all kind of fades away. And then for like thousands of years, the site is totally forgotten. People are coming and going, and the site is totally buried, erased from memory. Um, layer upon layer of like earth and mud and clay kind of accumulates over it, and then through these through these extremely unlikely series of events, um, you end up having people who are interested in the site, um, who are capable of like excavating it, you know, who are capable of kind of visualizing and excavating it like delicately enough to preserve uh, these objects that are thousands of years old um, and bring them to light again and just amaze us with these dazzling glimpses of this like totally forgotten world. It's, it's, it's just incredible. Yeah, it, it is really, really amazing. And, um, you know, the way they have so delicately, they have uh, created 
the pit and then they have decorated the pit of course in the following uh, season we were able to understand that they were not only using copper they were using state iron lays also uh, on their coffins and uh, you know there is a chamber like structure near the uh, where the burials were and perhaps they were using that structure for some sort of pre burial ritual or something like that hmm. and there is a pit oh, rituals where again they... no? our old friends uh, yeah <laughs> and i there was a pit where they are sacrificing animals because we found uh, uh, bones animal bones in that pit hmm. and um, it's all of this in one burial complex Incredible. you know all of this and it's it's not only um, you know extended burials that is burials where the entire skeleton is found uh, it's also in secondary context that is where they are not able to find the body but they are burying the remains or they are just um, you know uh, the burying some things that belong to that person hmm. so that is like secondary burial or um, symbolic burial so all of that is also present in in this excavation of course all this resonates the previous excavation as well but this excavation was very important and the following season we found two more skeletons uh, two more burials uh, and we found um, uh, furnaces and this is a little away from where uh, the uh, the burials were and about uh, 200 meters away from where the burials were found and there these furnaces are the example or you know they showcase their metallurgical skills uh we found slags from the burials of course a lot of analysis scientific analysis is pending uh but we know that they were using these big furnaces to manufacture copper objects there's no doubt in my mind and mm. everything even the placement of these furnaces even the you know the, the whole science aspect of which involves in metallurgy everything is really uh really really remarkable really remarkable the burials were in in one alignment so we understand that their workshop which was within the domestic or habitation area hmm. of the you know inhabitants of sanoli it was a very systematic workshop it was not half visit it was not that you know they'll build something anywhere there was a system in place hmm. and it's very interesting to see that that's fascinating it, it also occurs to me that just just how different these people are from the harappans right because harappans generally aren't found with a lot of grave goods and generally speaking harappans aren't even like buried that frequently it might have been only one particular ethnic or religious group among the harappans who were buried but this is obviously a very 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 different culture because yeah, evidence buried harappans are buried of course there are different even in harappan culture also there are there are different types of burials like right. symbolic secondary and extended burials and of course there are grave goods like this but the type of goods and the number of goods vary hmm. uh and of course here we have legged coffins not to say that the coffins were not found in harappa there are evidence of coffins found in harappan context hmm. but they, these are different okay they are more local hmm. uh so that's what you know i come to the first point i've mentioned the fashion the sensibility is you know how they're fashioning a particular object or a thing or a feature is the local is it's hmm. local to exactly so uh, it happens even today right cotton is is tra- you know it's exported even uh, across the domestic realm it's it's everywhere but production of co- cotton is limited right hmm. but you see with with uh, trade and everything the way a dress is manufactured in or or is fashioned in a particular place differs hmm. right even if we use the same uh, material so something like that is happening at sanoli incredible so can you try to give us a sense adisha of like who these people who are buried at sanoli were who who were these folks who deserved these enormous necropolises um were they kings were they queens were they warriors um what can we kind of broadly guess about the society that chose to bury their dead in this kind of way and also can tell us a little bit about the habitation area like what do we know about um, political hierarchies for example are we able to make any uh, broad guesses about class relations or or economic uh, structure for example see burials are the mirror to the um, in society so when you know burials are, are this wholesome package where you can find everything you can find class 
uh, distinction. You can find religious aspect. You can find, of course, different economical uh, variation or differences also because of the barrel goods that we find. Uh, when I look at the barrels and the barrels of 2018 and 19's excavation, um, I see that the people who, who, who were buried, uh, they were warriors. Because why would you bury chariots hmm. uh, with shield, with a dagger, hmm. with a blade sword, with a torch hmm. in one barrel pit? Torches as well. Interesting. And it must be... There, there must be a lot of uh, other wooden objects also because uh, in our later excavations, we understood, you know, as we were going on we, uh, with the excavation, we sort of understood that there was a lot of wooden objects that were present in the pit. But because of the nature, wood decomposes and you can't see it with the naked eye. We have sacrificed it. But we can now understand or when we are reconstructing it, we have to understand that there must be a lot of wooden objects also. Hmm. So why would you bury a person with so many weaponries? That person was using those weaponries, hmm. right? And in one of the burial pit where all of these weapons were found, that skeleton was missing. Hmm. And only the remains, like few bones were buried, which suggests that the person must have died somewhere. Yeah, and they weren't able to get his body back. They, yes, but with the big one, the big burial, uh, the, uh, the, uh, which is about eight feet in length, the coffin, not the human, the coffin is uh, eight feet. But uh, there we found two chariots. Hmm. Okay. And there we couldn't find any weaponry. But we found Electrum Spectre Top. What is that? And Electrum is actually an alloy of gold and silver. And it's naturally found, but only in Anatolia. Oh, wow. So they are take, getting it from there. Oh, my God. That's incredible. Because you can't, uh, it's very difficult. Either they are they are so skilled metallurgists hmm. that they're trading gold and silver's alloy or they are, they are trading with Anatolia. And there is one reference in Harappa also, but they couldn't, they, the same question, either they are creating on their own or they're getting from Anatolia. But Electrum's natural uh, deposit is only there in Anatolia. So they must be getting it. From there, so the spectre top sort of uh, tells us a lot. Plus, there was a chalice with a tortoise base, uh -huh. and it was kept upside down because the tortoise base was very small to hold the weight of the chalice. So it was turned upside down. It was under the uh, coffin, and that coffin is so well uh, decorated because you we there are eight anthropomorphic figures hmm. and let me tell you not only metallurgy even the woodwork is amazing because these uh, anthropomorphic figures are basically on high relief wooden carvings and then the copper plating is done so yeah, so they are so good with wood craftsmanship also um, which is amazing so why would you spend money on getting that particular coffin made if it was not an important person hmm. You know, it's my question. Of course, that person must be important, but we can't say that the person was a king or a queen. It'll be just uh, assuming things. Right now, we know that the person is buried there and we are not able to open the coffin even till now. We know the skull, where the skull is because we could we expose the skull, but we are still, every time we go and see that coffin, we are always trying to figure out how to open the uh, you know, the coffin, we have tried everything uh, from x-rays, portable x-rays to everything, but we are unable to, you know, open it. We don't want to sacrifice the lid because the, in, in the history of archaeology and in, in the entire subcontinent, there has been no reference to a coffin with a lid and lid with anthropomorphic figures. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the first, so we can't sacrifice it. We know there is somebody buried and we know there are goods also buried in the coffin. Hmm. Uh, that's why it's so long uh, in, in length. Um, uh, and of course, there are other other goods also. There are two chariots, full chariots. Hmm. And there, there was a whip also. Interesting. It's, wow. I mean... We can understand that there's some sort of, uh, you know, uh, division. Hmm. But exactly we can't point out. And um, your question about habitation side, from the habitation perspective, we were only able to find furnaces because we have not, if we are not able to excavate Sonali again. We are hoping that we will excavate soon because we have mapped out the entire site. We have done the GPR and magnetometry survey. So we have the data with us. We have done the work. 
all we have to do is go and start excavating uh so hoping that in our future excavations we will be able to find more evidence from the habitation site as well oh wow um once again like i've i've just been kind of lost in this historical reverie uh, as you've been talking there's this uh, this fact that they have electrum is is just blowing my mind because um whether they are skilled metal smiths or whether they are importing from anatolia both of those go to show you that exactly. these, these are very very interesting alternatives and they're very fascinating people as well and yeah. um i was also thinking that clearly this kind of burial where you're giving them all these grave goods right i think generally the the assumption is that there's some kind of belief in a life after death which is why they need these goods um to to kind of use them and um some of the things that you mentioned like the these kind of drinking chalice uh, and even a torch um Uh, was was the torch kind of a, was it was it a grave good or was it just kind of used to light up the the the, the mausoleum it was buried so it was not in use at that point of time so must be used earlier by this person so it was buried next to the dagger and other weaponry used earlier okay that's that's that that again is quite interesting because it brings up the question of like what were they using the torch for clearly either it must have been associated with them fairly frequently in life yeah. um was it a kind of ritual thing <laughs> or um or i don't know like did did they, did they use it to light their way into the underworld or something like this is no way to tell because of this intangible of stuff course, is lost you know uh, life after death is not such an alien concept for even chalcolithic or bronze age because from hmm. right from neolithic all across the globe you know uh you know what i mean neolithic yeah, like let's just go to upper paleolithic mesolithic hmm. you know uh, there are evidence that even prehistoric man is, is started to develop this uh belief system so there is this concept of life after death right and it's not only in the harappans or not only in the sonali context there are other chalcolithic sites such as in amgao in deccan where hmm. you know um, their rituals are very uh, local and they have their own set even today even today um, when we bury our dead or we cremate we always praying for uh, the journey you know after hmm. uh, so we always have this understanding i think it's more a homo sapien thing <laughs> then then anything else of course regionally and locally things change uh, the the mantras and the things we chant uh, while praying might differ or the offerings might differ but a lot of things remain the same which is very much homo sapien in nature i think it's it's really interesting and of course there are a lot of uh, pottery that is there plethora of pottery we we can't ignore that and some pots are sealed okay hmm. uh, so they are sealed which suggests that there must be some organic material um uh, in in it a uh, water or grains or something like that which they are bearing with the dead hmm. uh, and of course there must be some sort of uh meaning to it so interesting it's it's it 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 the the the, the possibilities alone are so staggering yeah burial archaeology is just amazing it's, it's fascinating i told you burials are mirror to the society they can tell you so many things if yeah. we focus or we collect enough data we can understand a lot okay wow um all of this is just so fascinating i probably sound like a broken record at this point but i mean i'm 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 kind of like staggered for words really at this point um so two final questions really that i had uh, the shah the first is you kept talking about chariots um and the fact that there's this particular burial that has two chariots in it so clearly the chariots were very very important to the people of sonali but there's also been a little bit of controversy about like what exactly these are like um the one controversial opinion is that they're actually carts for example so what's your take on that and the second question is um another thing that's been kind of going viral about sonali is that women have also been discovered buried and uh, some people have taken it upon themselves to say that oh yes this is proof that uh, you know the 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 people of sonali were um were totally egalitarian and women also fought as warriors blah 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 so leaving aside the whole debate about um the vedic peoples and the the quote unquote aryans and so on which which i promise our listeners we will get to in in a full length episode later on what do you think of, about this like who were these women who were being buried Well, I'll I'll answer your first question first because the second question is going to take some time. Sure. Uh, so, so first question that whether it's a cart or a chariot, uh, people who claim that it's chariot have not seen 
the chariots in uh, you know they have not seen it neither on site nor where they are housed right now so uh, if they claim it's it's a cart they are very much welcome to come and see for themselves and make a judgment but till then uh, i think <laughs> without understanding the the entire you know the technological aspect the engineering of it all it's it's really ridiculous to claim it as cart i'll tell you why because you need to understand that there are two wheels there are two solid wheels there is an axle attached to it there is a d frame uh, which is you know a, f- a frame which is d in in d shape uh, which sort of gives the shape of the whole buggy which is uh, must be on top uh, and and there is there are, there is yoke and the pole of the chariot which is connected to the entire frame so uh, all of that is intact with the hooks with all the other aspects okay so nothing is that missing and we filling it we have all the photographic evidence we have lifted the chariots they are there hmm. so uh, and then and when you call it a cart in india we have multiple examples even in harappan context there are two wheel carts mostly even today you will find only two wheel carts hmm. but where are those two wheels my question is right at the center of the cart hmm. right where the whole you know where the board is where you sit or you store the goods right at the center of it hmm. and there will be a distance between uh, you know there will be a, a longer pole right hmm. which will be connected right at the center where the axle is because how else you going to move it there will be the structuring of the frame will differ in the case of sanadis and the reason why we say chariot is that the axle and the frame are not long it they are very close hmm. there is not much gap for it to go all the way back you know and if it's a um, if it's a cart then the two wheels in front will not support the board Hmm. because if there is an animal you know of course there must be an animal or two animals actually uh, if if you know you place the yoke on the animal the frame will just go and hit the floor hit the ground hmm. because it it will not tally the angle won't be perfect so for for it to be a card the wheel have to be right at the center and the pole and the yoke have to be really long Hmm. here it's attached in such a place that we know that it's a smaller sort of a buggy where only two people can stand hmm. okay you have to stand because there is a frame to hold and that frame we have the ct scan of the sediments from the frame because as i've mentioned the wood we can't find we can't identify with the naked eye so we've got that scanned and we know what carvings were done on that frame on that you know the big frame hmm. so the reconstruction if anyone has seen the documentary of sonali the reconstruction is not the figment of our imagination those floral patterns are actually there hmm so we of course are uh, in the midst of finishing the report all of this is going to be in the report uh, and i'm sure it it creates confusion when the, the evidence are not made public or they are not presented in the form of report but we are working as hard as possible to finish it um, you know uh, all of us are busy in other things but we are giving sonali our, our you know enough time so we finish the report soon so all of that is there the design the floor of pattern on the board and the frame is not our imagination it is there it is we have evidence so people need to understand that when it's a d shaped frame there will be a, a you know something to hold on and there is so how will it sit how will it sit how far the board is going to go the length of the board where of the cart you really need to really use your brain in order to understand this thing and with one picture is you making an interpretation and i'm so sad to see even scholars big scholars making such claims just to fit their uh, you know their theories that is really sad uh, i think uh, we need of course sonali has given us so much and of course it has given rise to a lot of confusion but to make preconceived notion is something which is not right of course it's a chariot That's There's that's no that's a very good point actually Desha this this the fact that 
as soon as sonali kind of like hit the news cycle recently um the immediate response seems to have been to kind of incorporate either into a right wing or into left wing political yeah, mythology yeah. um and th- there's such a injustice to our past for the simple reason that um the past involves so much that we simply do not know um yeah. by automatically assuming that every new piece of evidence that surfaces um must fit into one or the other end of the political spectrum um we do ourselves an injustice because we we prevent ourselves from being able to see clearly the things that we don't know and kind of use them to evolve a new understanding of where we who we are and where we really come from um so thank you so much for bringing up that point thank you and i think it's important that we understand because we need to give credit to the archaeologists you know people like dr manjul and all you know i don't think anyone in our team we belong to any political spectrum or we have any sort of belief system or no archaeologist usually is trained in that way uh, what we trying to do is we have excavated a site and we have a lot of evidence and we are trying to make sense and uh, whether it's a card or a chariot on a basis of a photograph if somebody is making assumption um then i don't know uh, uh we need to justify it uh i would really like people coming up with justification for calling it a cart i would really be interested in seeing other interpretations because it's always healthy to see other side also but um it's it's charit it always uh, i'm going to stand and and say it's it's charit there's no doubt hmm. there is absolutely no doubt and hopefully this 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 the um, right wing or the left wing appropriation of sonali is something that we will touch upon in our discussion of the uh, the migrations of the late bronze age and and the peoples who entered the subcontinent at the time but um we're almost out of time for today disha so um you just perhaps your thoughts on women buried at sonali before oh, yeah. we wrap up i'm i'm sorry i forgot that oh, no oh worries. yes <laughs> uh, women of sonali uh see why is there is such an amusement that women were part of or they were they they knew some you know they were aware of war craft why i mean i really don't understand it is us now that we have made a society so rigid and and we have closed a lot of uh, you know i'm sorry if i'm sounding like a feminist but it's now that we have done it no no i mean please it, it is you know, it is good that you sound like a feminist that's something that we're all in support of so it's it's not that if see even in 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 many other cultures even modern or medieval cultures like let's just say rajput women were trained because what if some you know enemy attacks their uh, palace or their settlement and there is no men to protect them they should be able to protect themselves even the sikh women they carry a uh, weapon with them you know that um, a smaller uh, it's because it's of course it's religious now it's a religious uh, symbol but earlier before that every woman who was living in punjab especially the buffer zone from where all the invasions have happened they knew how to use weaponry because what if an invasion happens hmm. and what if there is no man to protect them so, you know so there is nothing unusual in that aspect we are not saying that these women were fighting wars we are simply saying that there is a piece of weaponry found in the graves yeah more importantly it's not it's not a sign of like extraordinary gender equality either um the fact that women have to defend themselves from men is in itself a very clear indication of the fact that th- these are these relations are not equal another thing is that the weapon are very small hmm i don't know why maybe the person was buried is of small age or whatever it is but it's not that they are using big weapons like men so uh, it's there it's not an unusual thing i think we need to really now broaden our minds and look at it from a much better perspective we are so closed up when it comes to women issues like you know oh my god so not even women were there the women were fighting wars and nothing unusual i think our past uh, of course uh, you know now that we don't uh, let a lot of uh, we, we don't give our women freedom it's only now right hmm. uh, of course even back then also a lot of nonsense I mean, yeah <laughs> Uh, no one would justify that <laughs> but it's really stupid to even assume i think from that perspective what we need to do is we are waiting for a lot of scientific analysis we are waiting for the study of the skeletons also so i think it takes time for an excavation you know post excavation the work to be carried on it takes time because science uh, we need scientific 
analysis and that takes time. We are all busy with our work to come up with the report. It takes time. So I think uh, by the time we finish the report, these things are going to keep coming up. Hmm. I don't think... The underlying dynamic is really the same, is, yeah. is that we we seem to be chronically unable to rise beyond our own kind of short-term political agendas to appreciate something that could very often totally confound and transform them if you only allowed it to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, wow. Um, how do I even begin to sum up this absolutely fascinating conversation? Like we started off talking about the nuts and bolts of like how archaeology actually works. And this has told us this fascinating human stories about like how these discoveries were actually made. Um, and leaving aside all, all the stories that have been told about Sonali um, and all the documentaries and all the uh, raving news articles that have been made about whether it disproves this, that or the other theory, I think we can all agree that the people of Sonali are a profoundly interesting piece in this enormous tapestry or jigsaw puzzle of Indian history. Um, these are people who are trading perhaps with um, people as far away as Anatolia. Uh, these are a warlike people. These are people um, who clearly respect their dead, believe in some form of afterlife and who are extraordinary craftsmen who are um, taking so much care and time and attention um, to kind of make sure that their dead have this interesting existence after their deaths. Um, and beyond everything else, yeah, just to see where they fit into this um, enormous canvas of the Bronze Age itself, their relations with the Harappans and their potential connections uh, with other Bronze Age warrior chariot riding aristocrats um, is just so extraordinarily exciting to me. Our conversations with Disha are always so fascinating. Thank you. Thank you again so much, uh, Disha, for taking the time for being here and for telling us all these incredible stories. Thank you so much for having me yet again. <laughs> it, it was fun. Really. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so to all of our listeners, thank you all for listening to this point. Please follow Disha on uh, Instagram uh, at Confessions of an Archaeologist. She's one of the most interesting uh, pages out there and she's doing some really fantastic work with is providing a platform generally for young archaeologists to share their skills and their knowledge with the rest of us. So why would you say no to free knowledge? Um, on that note, uh, thank you again, Disha, for joining us. And uh, thank you all so much for, for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, Check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IVM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession, and I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life altering techniques, and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do, your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe, be well, be empowered. Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5-minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday as I explore the strange, obscure, and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before. You can find us on the IBM Podcast app, website, or wherever you get your podcast from.